Coming up next Friday night, it's Bellator 147. We're joined by Mans going moving up to the 205 pound division to take on Virgil's Wicker. It's Brian Rogers. Brian, appreciate the time. Before we kind of get talking about what's going on with your career, uh, I know for this fight, you are you're trying to help raise money for a nonprofit organization called Kids Capes of Courage. Can you kind of explain to my listeners what this is all about? Yeah, so a good friend of mine uh, back in Ohio, my good friend Alex Roll's mother, uh, Debbie Rowland, started this charity. So, um, as you know, there's a lot of kids who face a variety of like terminal illnesses um, out there, which can be pretty frustrating when a kid, you know, born professionally in this world and then has like an illness or something bestowed upon them that you don't really typically expect. So they started a nonprofit, um, which basically they built capes for kids that are in need, whether they're terminally ill, severely sick, or just maybe have you know, a troubled past or some sort of abuse of that type of nature. So they, uh, they, they can make and sew these capes for kids and they bring them to a variety of different hospitals or send them to kids. And, you know, it just lights their day absolutely up. You know, it's just something for them to be excited about that day. And, you know, kind of just brings their spirits up and during a tough situation. So um, it's a nonprofit. So everyone kind of who's involved, you know, they work typical jobs, um, they do this and that. They get some donations here or there, but it's like handmade hours that people are taking off work. You know, they have to buy materials, things like that. So I'm trying to just get them some notification, excuse me, notoriety rather, um, through my cause. So me and all my cornermen will be rocking uh, Kids Capes of Courage to the cage next Friday. Uh, excuse me, the following Friday, December 4th, when I'm fighting Virgil Wicker. And uh, we have a GoFundMe started. We have a goal. Or I set a goal. I want to hopefully raise, help them raise $2,500. Um, between now and Christmas. So we got some work to do. We're about 200 or so dollars up there. So the best place for them to find the link out is just go to your uh, Twitter account, be Raj the Predator. Yes, yes. And just, if you Google Kids Case Occurs or search around GoFundMe, you should be able to find it. But just check out my social media, um, be Raj the Predator on Twitter and Instagram. You should be able to find it uh, there. Of course, coming up here, December the 4th, Bellator 147. Uh, we we talked, uh, you know, probably I guess it was probably about two months ago about moving up to 205 pounds. So how has this training camp been different than opposed to your previous training camps at 185? You know, it's one of those where I feel like I'm kind of taking the gloves off or taking the shackles off. I'm able to strength train in a little bit different of a manner. And a lot of my weight camp, or excuse me, camps have kind of, they kind of cycle around a lot of weight cutting. You know, I, I kind of, was, I keep notes of all my weight cuts and I looked at my last, um, I looked at my last camp and I was only able to diet till about 204, 205. Drank some, drank a good amount of water Saturday. Sunday, I drank three gallons of water the Sunday before I fought all training and I went to bed at 220. Um, made weight, obviously, but that's just a tremendous amount of stress on my body. You know, right now I've been able to put more time and effort into my strength conditioning training um, because I've had better energy and as well as my skill training because I've had better energy and I have to focus on, you know, doing up early morning cardio every day, trying to get my weight down. So, you know, I played football at about 235 in college and I just think, you know, I was able to get down, you know, in the, in the mid to late 2000s. I started my career a little bit easier, but I was training a little bit different. And I lost a lot of that football bulk. Well, you know, as you know, you get older and your body kind of changes and I kind of go back into my training conditioning and this was kind of harder to uh, get down that size. So I think my power and my speed is going to carry over. I, I never fought a guy that I thought was faster than me at 185 and I still don't expect that to happen in 205. And then, you know, my strength and power and durability is going to increase as well. I know due to your daytime job, you get to travel a lot. You've trained at a couple of gyms for this fight. So what are kind of some of the things you took at training at a gym like AKA to, to build into this fight? You know, I mean, um, I got a chance. I was in there for a day just the way this guy was allowed. You know, um, I don't know Luke Rockhold super well, but we had met a few times. And I contacted my buddy, a speaker of my OSA, who got me in touch with him. And so, you know, uh, you know, no fireworks. It kind of flows far and talked about technique and some styles and some footwork and stance stuff, things like that. So, you know, it was a good experience to walk through the door. Javier Hernandez, Bob Cook, all those guys were great, you know, and definitely, you know, opening, welcoming, welcome on. But, you know, this is a nice thing to pop in. You know, most of my time I've been at Factory X, you know, I mean, uh, primarily and then doing my training conditioning at the renowned Stedman Hawkins uh, performance under Eric Kelly and Lauren Landau. Um, but, no, it was good just to trade to my uh, trade to my ideas and techniques and things like that. Um, over a day period. Kind of ironic because my training partner, Chris Camozzi, was actually been with Chris Wyatt in the last two weeks helping him for his fight. So, you know, I was in California for a day. So, kind of funny. 
looking at this fight here with Virgil, 14 and four and one in his career. He, he's been uh, unbeaten his past couple of fights here. Uh, height disadvantage for you here. Is that a big deal? Um, you know, I mean, I'm, I would be, sh- I would probably be short at 155 almost or 170. You know what I mean? Uh, um, I'm just under six foot and five eleven and change, and that's just that you know it's just a middle of the range height. You know, you got you got one fifty five like Cowboy Cerrone there, um, you know six one for instance. You got you know you got tons of tall Walter weights out there. You know, I'm just kind of a middle range height. You know, so I'm kind of used to that. You know, I fought a lot of taller guys. You know, I was able to get inside. Um, you know, on Cardero quite you know quite easily before you know before he put me. Um, you know, things like that. Um, so I don't really worry about it too much. I'm kind of hoping to channel my inner Mike Tyson, if you will, you know, with this weight class up and be, a, you know, a little bit shorter in stature, but thicker and stronger than most guys still. I don't really see myself being out-muscled by anybody um, at 205. I was watching an interview with you here earlier today where you're talking about being the smarter fighter. Is that simply of making sure that you don't get into the brawl that Virgil's going to likely want to get into? Yeah, to a point, or you just kind of have to pick your spots. You know what I mean? He's a really tough, durable guy. So the first time you clip him, he's not necessarily always ready to go. You know, he bounces back. It counters pretty well and takes the play away from people and kind of changes the gears up. So just being intelligent, you know what I mean? He's got a strong, quick right hand. He's much quicker than he looks, you know, just walking around and kind of break down his footwork and, uh, you know, movement and whatnot on tape. So, yeah, just not – not wanting to plant my feet and just slug in the middle, you know, I still really like my chances if it goes that way. But, you know, you know, I want this to be a skilled, a skilled fight where I show a variety of different things on my feet, not just plant our feet in cement and play rock and sock and robots. Do you feel like your back's against the wall here? Uh, absolutely it is. I mean, I'm looking at it in all reality. Um, if I don't pull out a win, that could be, I mean, not from the time I end of my career, but it's probably, you know, I'm probably looking at a release from Bellator as a poor performance, you know what I mean, or something like that. You know, if it's if it's a great fight or fight of the night or something like that, that could save me, but I need a win. You know, that doesn't, you know, the fight of the night doesn't get me any more money or anything like that. So, yeah, definitely backs against the wall. Um, it's a must win. You know, I've never really had a desire to go back and fight on the local scene. You know, some lots of people do that to get back on track and things like that, but I've just got a lot of other things going on in my life where I don't know if that would be the best decision uh, for, for me as a person. So most definitely, you know, kind of a me against the world type of type of fight. Do you wish you would move up to 205 sooner than you did? Um, Yeah, probably. You know, most likely um, within the last couple of fights just because the weight cuts have been super tough. You know, and I use George Lockhart. He's one of the best, uh, I think the best nutritionist in the, uh, in the MMA game, um, personally. And, you know, I've been writing one of his plans. I follow his plan strictly. It's just you know, being busy in life, getting older, your body just changes a little bit. And, you know, eating off the correct meal plan and doing things for weeks on end, but it's still tough um, to get down. You know, even, you know, with this fight, I still don't feel like I'm at as quite as ready as I'd like to be at 205. You know, um, I think I'd be a little bit, a little bit leaner still and a little bit, a little bit more size on. But, you know, I got this call in five, six weeks notice, and I was training, of course, uh, and ready. But I still, you know, still want to transform my body uh, uh, a little bit more. In terms of uh, Virgil here, I, I know uh, people think of him as a right hand. What else do you have to look out for that he does really well? You know, I mean, he's got good – his footwork's impressive. You know what I mean? When he chooses to leg kick, it's impressive. Um, and he's just a lot – he's quicker and more agile than you think. You look at him, a guy who's going to plod, you know, kind of plods around. He's got pretty good footwork. You know, he, you haven't seen him too much on the ground, and he does a good job of getting off the ground when he is uh, – when he is put there, but you know, he's a tough, durable guy who comes for, and that's, that's something you just can't really teach or, you know, account for. It, it was kind of interesting. I was looking up your Bellator stats. I didn't realize this, that you're 13 of 15 in takedown attempts. Yeah. I mean, uh, I've had a good wrestling background. I wrestled in high school. I was a guy who won sectionals twice, went to district three times in Ohio and just never made a mistake. I didn't start wrestling until eighth grade. So I wrestle a lot more just kind of off of athletic ability uh, and things of that nature. Um, but, you know, when I want to generally put a guy down, um, they go there. It's just something I just haven't really implemented in my games, I believe, in my stand-up so much. But, you know, uh, you know, if we get there, I definitely, you know, if the opportunity comes, I need to present itself, I should say. I definitely need to use it a little, a little bit more. 
Yeah, the reason I bring that up is just people think of you from the striking aspect. And final thing, once again, we've been joined by Brian Rogers, who competes at Bellator 147 on December the 4th, taking on Virgil Swicker. Of course, it's a fight they can watch on Spike TV beginning at 9 p.m. Eastern time. Brian, did I see where uh, you got another stripe on your uh, jiu-jitsu belt? Yeah, you know, I've been at it, you know. So I kind of was off and on in the E when I was back home in Ohio. And then I got my, I received my blue belt um, shortly before I felt Mikhail Parlo in 2013. And then since moving to Denver and being a factory that's under uh, J.J. Pugsley and Chase Hackett, Manimal Jiu-Jitsu, um, I just really just invested a lot more time in my in my ground game and just really kind of fell in love with Jiu-Jitsu again. So, yeah, I mean, there's a ton of high-quality guys in my gym. Denver's a bit of a hotbed for Jiu-Jitsu. They just had a uh, even a Denver Metamora-style um, all Jiu-Jitsu professional fighting thing over the weekend. So there's a lot of good guys around here and I hit some open mats and things like that to go with some other guys as well. So, you know, just uh, trying to be a well-rounded martial artist and, and uh, increase that part of my game. Denver's kind of coming a hotbed of MMA as well with all the guys that are training there now. Yeah, there's a lot of people, you know, I think, you know, there's a lot of facilities in, in, uh, in Denver to train at. There's a ton of jiu-jitsu and a ton of MMA and pretty much all the higher level guys kind of settle, uh, with us here at Factory X or, um, you know, with Elevation and the Muscle Farm guys, which I go over there and wrestle sometimes. But I think we're, you know, those two facilities are kind of the lead in the pack. And there's a lot of, uh, you know, actually com- camaraderie amongst the higher level guys, you know what I mean, that kind of cross train and do some things together as well. Of course, everyone knows about Team Elevation there, all the stuff going on there. Brian, really appreciate time. Good luck in the fight here at Bellator 147 on December the 4th, man. Appreciate it. Thank you very much.